and now for something completely different. I asked Nancy to uh, send an email out encouraging everyone to have pen and paper ready uh, for the beginning of the sermon. And then I reminded you when we started uh, earlier this morning uh, to be ready because we're going to do a fill in the blank um, to lead into our sermon topic for the morning. So I'm going to read a sentence and you're going to fill in the blank. It'll be up on the screen and so you can read it and then uh, just write down your answers as you think about it. So here we go. When I got up this morning, I felt blank. When I got up this morning, I felt blank. So I fill in the blank. What did you do? Then, after I got up, I talked to fill in the blank. I talked to fill in the blank and I felt fill in the blank. <clears throat> During this time of being cut off, from getting to spend time with my friends and family, I really dislike fill in the blank. During this time of being cut off from getting to spend time with my friends and family, I really dislike fill in the blank. So instead, I do fill in the blank. I really dislike fill in the blank. So instead I do fill in the blank. Last, last one coming up here. Ready? You, you getting the hang of this now? While I'm doing whatever I just wrote in the above blank, God feels fill in the blank about what I am doing. While I am doing whatever that thing was, God feels fill in the blank about what I am doing. Everybody done? What does that little thought progression tell you about your relationship with God? Why does God feel that way? about what you're doing. Is God your loving heavenly father or some something else? Or alternate possibility, do you feel like God doesn't even care about what you're doing? What does that mean? Well, is it true? Does God not care about what you are doing where you are, how you feel right now? As we asked last week, hopefully in a better place now than when we started the sermon last week, we asked the question, but what does the Bible say? Can we do some Old Testament first? Sometimes the right scripture can just blow our preconceptions to smithereens. Is God scary? He could be. After all, he's God. He knows everything. He is everywhere, all at once. He is all powerful. That's all pretty scary stuff, right? But shepherd boy David, do you remember him? He wrote poems like the 23rd Psalm, which is very comforting when you yourself are shepherd. But turn with me to Psalm 139. We don't know when in his life David wrote this psalm. It is attributed to him. 
But I suggest to you this morning that it's kind of a grown up, expanded version of Psalm 23, at least to me. And in a time when we need privacy settings, because the more people know about us, the more they can exploit us, there is no hint of that fear of exploitation in this psalm. To David, to be known by God is amazing. It's not just a good thing, but a great thing, the ultimate protection. And so please listen as I read this psalm. Psalm 139, starting in verse 1. O Lord, you have searched me, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my coming in, or my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O God. You hem me in. Behind and before, you've laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee? from your presence. If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I saddle on the far side of the sea, even there, your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me. Even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Drop down to verse 23. And there's a shift from sharing to requesting. And so in this prayer, David says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. God, you know me. You know my motives. You know my innermost thoughts. And to David, it is awesome. Search me, God. Not that you have to. You already have. But I invite you to know my thoughts. And not just any thoughts. My anxious thoughts. And if there is any offensive way in me. All that yucky stuff, all that sinful, shameful stuff, please, oh God, lead me out of that and into the way everlasting. Lead me into health and wholeness and eternity. 
take away my habits, my hangups, my addictions, my rebellions, my fears, my everything else that would separate me from you. This whole psalm is a prayer. It's a conversation with God. David lived around 1000 BC, and this psalm reflects his view of God as a person who lived a thousand years before Jesus at that stage in human development. Well, about 14 years goes by, and a kid is captured by Irish pirates and taken to Ireland, where he is sold to a flock herder. You can't make this stuff up. Eventually, this boy gets back to his home in England, does the equivalent of going to seminary, then returns to Ireland as a missionary. His name is Patrick, the one that we will come to know as St. Patrick. Tradition tells us that around 433 AD, Patrick wrote this prayer for divine protection before successfully converting the Irish King Leary and his subjects from paganism to Christianity. I'm only going to read excerpts. I'm not going to read the whole thing. But let's experience the breastplate of St. Patrick. He says, I arise today through a mighty strength, the invocation of the Trinity, through belief in the threeness, through confession of the oneness of the creator of creation. I arise today through the strength of heaven, the light of the sun, the radiance of the moon, the splendor of fire, the speed of lightning, the swiftness of wind the depth of the sea, the stability of the earth and the firmness of rock. I arise today through God's strength to pilot me, God's might to uphold me, God's wisdom to guide me, God's eye to look before me, God's ear to hear me, God's word to speak for me. God's hand to guard me, God's shield to protect me, God's host to save me from snares of devils, from temptation of vices, from everyone who shall wish me ill, afar or near. Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ on my right, Christ on my left, Christ when I lie down, Christ when I sit up, Christ when I arise, Christ in the heart of every man who thinks of me, Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks for me, Christ in every eye that sees me, Christ in every ear that hears me. I arise today through a mighty strength, the invocation of the Trinity, through belief in the threeness, through confession of the oneness of the creator of creation. Just like Psalm 139. We have a request for God to surround me in every way possible. In every area of life, God, my breastplate, my protection, that which guards my heart. Everywhere we look, there is Christ. Everyone we encounter, there is Christ. From the 1400s, to today during COVID-19. We can pray that same kind of confident prayer based on the same kind of relationship with God. God is with me. What need I fear? Yes, I wear a mask and gloves when I go out. 
And the Jews in the days of Nehemiah kept their swords and their shields at the ready too, as they rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem in obedience to the commands of God. Relying on God is not to be stupid and ignore sound advice, but to live in panic and overwhelming anxiety is not living the victorious Christian life. David invites God to examine his heart and ferret out any anxious thoughts. That probably wouldn't be such a bad idea for us today. Unless, of course, you don't trust God's love enough to do what's best for you. I am learning. I am learning. I'm not there yet. I am learning to trust in that kind of love. For all kinds of crazy reasons I got growing up, God knowing my heart was a potentially really bad thing. But I hope that as I grow in Christ, from a baby Christian to one that is a bit more mature, I will, like David and like Patrick, invite God in, welcome him in, because of the trust that I have in his intentions for me. God be with you and with you. Many church groups would say those words as they used to depart from times of worship together in assemblies that they can no longer attend until quarantine is done. It's not a bad custom at all. But if you think about it, God already is with you and with you and with you and with you. But you know, it doesn't hurt to remind each other of the truth of that. God is in the aisles of Walmart. God is in the ERs and ICUs of our hospitals. God is with grieving families sharing their grief. God is with you in your going out and your coming in. God is with you. That should be the best news you get all day. Let's live moment by moment in the comfort of his presence. Amen. Be still, my soul.